Hi there. Um, so this is the next in a series of lectures on the structure agency debate. Um, and in this particular one, I'm going to focus more on the agency side of the argument. And in this um, lecture, we're going to be examining the symbolic interactionist um, theories, if you like. So there is a, a range of them. Um, this is a slide we've looked at before. So just remind yourself what is the structure agency debate um, and uh, below are the key questions you want to consider. Like in what way are individual actions influenced by structures in society? At this point, you should be able to come up with quite a number of examples to illustrate that. Um, or are there any, is, it, is there more of a case that actually the world around us is created through our interactions with each other and repeated behaviour? You might not feel so confident in that side of the argument, which is what this lecture is going to hopefully generate some ideas for. And finally, as always with a theory essay, you just have to be mindful of what research methods are used by any theory that you're considering, whether it's a structure or agency, whether it's one of the a question on Marxism, and functionism, what have you, you know, what research methods are associated with each approach, a positivist or interpretivist. Um, this is another slide we looked at again, so I'm not going to spend much time here. It just you can pause it if you want. Just make a note of you know the division between the different perspectives, the different concepts associated with different view, and the different methods. Um, just to remind you, which could help you if you did get a structure agency question, a twenty mark essay. So, like I said, this lecture is going to look a bit more at the symbolic interactionist view. Um, or social action theories. Um, they're sort of grouped together quite often um, and they are very similar. Uh, for the sake of this topic, we're going to almost use them interchangeably. Um, so what is the process uh, that symbolic interaction is really interested in? Okay, so if you ever look at this image below, you've got a couple looking at a tree. Um, the woman is looking at it. She's imagining, oh, wow, that tree looks like it's going to give us some nice shade from the sun. The gentleman's looking at it and thinking, ah, look, there's loads of dangers associated with that tree. It's a, it looks like a green snake, a spider, and it could fall down, it looks like. Oh, no, sorry, not fall down. Now it looks like there's some beetles coming out of it. Um, so the symbolic interactionists would be really interested in how two individuals can look at exactly the same thing, or symbol, if you like, and how they could get very different meanings from it, and what things would they look at to get those different meanings. Um, so, for example, the lady saw the shade. That's what that's the symbol that she saw, and she thought she immediately linked shade with you know feeling cool in the sun. So that's the symbols that she saw. Uh, whereas the the bloke, he perhaps saw a bug, or maybe he's had a previous experience when he sat under a tree and a bug has jumped on him. So his interpretation of that tree is based on his previous experiences. Okay, so he he's seeing it in a very different way to that woman. Um, in terms of research methods, um, how would a researcher gain access to that thought process? So what research methods would allow you to really understand how people think and how they, how they come to their final decisions, how they come to their final ideas about what different things mean? So if you could annotate that on your notes, that'd be great. So agency sociologists argue that we use symbols and props in order to make sense of the world, okay? So we look for symbols and we ourselves will use props in order to kind of send messages out about ourselves, which other people will interpret as symbols. There are loads of different symbols and props that we use to make sense of the world or to create certain impressions. And there are some examples here. Uh, this may look familiar to some of you because it's what I looked at in year 12 when I introduced you to these ideas. So facial expressions are good to use as an example in an essay of symbols. Your face sends out, you know, symbols about how you're feeling. It sends uh, symbols to other people about how you want people to treat you. Um, so if you like, your own face is your own prop that you can move in certain ways to create either an impression about yourself that you want others to think or to generate reactions from others. Okay, so that's quite a complex area that you can use to generate symbols. Uh, there's also the sound or tone of your voice. Uh, if you want people to like you, you might use one tone of voice. If you want people to listen to you, respect you, you might use another tone of voice. Uh, if you want people to laugh, if you want people to cry, hopefully none of you want to do that. You, again, you'll use different tones of voice. Um, there's also material symbols, um, one that we're quite familiar with. So the type of car you drive perhaps might send out a symbol, an idea about you, or the clothing you wear. Um, I tend to use the example perhaps of sometimes uh, BMW drivers send out one symbol about themselves, you know, that they're perhaps maybe quite well off. Um, 
versus I don't know someone who perhaps drives around in a in a little smart car um, perhaps they're saying that you know maybe I don't know, the environment's more important to them you know those are the different things they might be saying about themselves through the the different cars that they drive hand gestures are a good example so um, we all might be very familiar with I don't know winking um, but you know you wouldn't wink uh, at just anyone you you would choose who you wink to um, because wink can be quite cheeky in one context it can be flirtatious uh, you could wink at someone if you want to really wind them up if you think something of them and you know you, you're just winking at them to wind them up so actually it is quite a complex gesture it doesn't just mean one thing winking and it depends on the context you're in um, I, for example I probably wouldn't wink at I don't know the Prime Minister if I walked past him um, because he would have someone or she would have such high status that I wouldn't think that's appropriate for me to do to them uh, and things like smell to be honest with you um, smell is a, is a set of symbols we make judgments or like oh that smells lovely that all oh, that smells very masculine oh that smells quite feminine that smells you know we even have pretty smells even though pretty is a, a visual word we can use it to describe a smell and then there's bad smells and that might lead us to make judgments about people as well in a neg more negative way um so this kind of, these examples in the next two slides are hopefully will help you understand how we use symbols. Um, and they're all around us. Uh, again, these will look familiar because they're drawn from our year 12 lessons. Uh, so Mead argued that we need to use symbols to make sense of the world. So if you look at this um, image, it's one that I've just grabbed from the internet. Um, I, I won't tell you what I googled to get this image, um, but you probably are able to guess what I googled because you'll look at this, you'll, you'll, you guys should be able to guess what this march is all about. Um, why are these people marching? Um, and how have, you, how have you managed to guess what these people are marching about? You know, um, The thing is, you've got to think that the sim signs are actually written in a completely different language. Um, so we can't read the signs and go, oh, this is a, 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 a such and such march. We're going to be looking at other areas to kind of guess what this is all about. Um, so I'm hoping most of you have come to the judgment that this is some sort of um, gay rights march or uh, equality for LGBT communities, etc. Um, so what did we look at here? So you've got the, the, the rainbow flag. Um, you've got um, perhaps the rainbow, the rainbow um, scarves people are wearing. Um, they're obviously very pleased about what they're doing and the messages that they're sharing. Um, so how do you think people are reacting to this march on the street for them to look like this? If so, you know, do, do you think people on the street that we can't see, do you think they are supportive? Do you think they're waving? Or do you think the people that we can't see are angry? Do you think they're standing there booing them or, or yelling at them abusively? Now, I'm guessing they're probably not, okay, because these people um, have selected their symbols, they're marching in this particular way. However, I'm guessing that they, they are actually being quite positively received, okay, uh, wherever they are in the world. I'm guessing that they feel that they're able to share their sexuality, they share their, their views on how people should be treated, purely by looking at the expressions on their face. Um, moving away from what this march is all about, I can also guess that it's really sunny where they are, uh, judging by symbols like sunglasses and t-shirts and, you know, even, uh, I guess, the weather that I can see in the background. I know from a very basic level that it's probably a sunny location wherever they are. So what's worth considering here is how will they negotiate their interactions? Okay, will they always act like this as a, as a, as a group or even as, as an individual? Um, and it's likely that this group, wherever they might be in the world, it, it looks like some Southeast Asian Asian country or Far Eastern country. Um, it's likely that they probably won't wear their sexuality on their sleeves at all times. It's likely that um, they might negotiate their identity. They might change their behaviour or modify it, depending if maybe they're a work environment or if they're spending time with their elderly relatives, for example, who perhaps might not have such liberal attitudes towards sexuality. Um, so will these marches behave like this in all contexts? Well, no. And that's your free will. That's your argument from the agency point of, of view. Um, if you're a functionalist, you know, people would behave the way they behave because of their norms, values and socialisation when they're very fixed in their roles. Well, actually, no, according to agency sociologists, that's not the case. Particularly Bloomer argued that people can change their behaviour depending on the context that they're in. They can react to those around them and negotiate how they behave. Uh this is a very different type of protest. Um, I won't mention right now what it what it is, um, but 
what same sort of uh, thought process that you went through in the last slide um what is going on in this image uh, any any guesses about what these um men i guess there's a lot of symbols there that say to me that they are they are predominantly men uh like you know their their build their, their height uh, their hairstyle um i'm i'm thinking men um what are they marching about or protesting about what do you think it might be um and why have they done this particular hand gesture now this obviously is a salute it's a nazi salute um it has a very particular meaning um on um about racial superiority under the nazis it was um you know aryans over particular minorities such as jews um but this is more than more than uh, establishing, and in this context, um, I'll, I'll let you know now. This is a, a, a put Britain first protest in in Manchester. Um, now they've obviously chosen this symbol because of their superiority, probably over I don't know, probably the Muslim community or immigrants. They're perhaps angry about. I'm guessing, um, but they also know that this symbol will will grab media coverage. So this is a more complex symbol selection than perhaps saying, "Oh, we just believe that we're better than other races." Um, I I would argue that they've consciously chosen a very controversial uh, symbol to create a particular impression and to get that media coverage. Um, I'm guessing these people don't wander around using that symbol all the time, but in this context, they've chosen it to get that particular impression because they want the media to cover it. And in this in this case, they're actually looking for almost negative reaction, whereas the previous slide was very much looking for positive reaction, uh, spreading a very different type of message. This group are almost wanting the police to police them. They want the media to report them on the on their on their protest, um, and you know what? To an extent, they kind of thrive off the public demonization of them. It kind of makes them feel that you know they are they united as a group. It kind of gives them that collective identity, uh, almost a bit like a subculture, if you like, a deviant subculture. Um, it kind of makes them feel more united in their views. That the mainstream society sort of denies their views, so therefore they're going to retreat into their subculture and share their own norms and values about racial superiority and you know preaching quite hateful language about other people. Um, so they clearly um, they probably do feel like outsiders. Um, and if they do feel like outsiders in society, you should know from your studies on the subcultural theory and, and Becker, perhaps um, symbolic interactionism, what's more likely to happen. Um, so just thinking about the researchers that you should be aware of uh, from the agency point of view, um, Cooley and Goffman. So do you think the, these men are acting in this way because of Cooley's looking glass self? So are they responding to the negative labels they've been given, their outsider status, as Becca would call it? Are they the product of society's negative labels of this social group? Uh, so therefore they're just acting how others expect them to act or do you think these guys are more a good better example of Goffman's impression management like have they consciously selected the symbols um, that they've used to create an impression to get a reaction are they in control um, can they switch it on and off um, what do you think and you know there's no right answer for this to be honest with you it's up to you what you what you might argue in fact you could use this as an example of both points of view um so hopefully that gives you an idea of how symbols are used um, and, and it's more than just them selecting the symbols and, and using them it's like how you've reacted to those symbols like hopefully when you've looked at this picture you've gone oh god that's horrible that's that's wrong that's vile um and that's because you have learned what that symbol means and what the connotations around it the history um so that's where your reaction would come from so just talking about symbolic interactionism then um, this is not a unified single theory like functionalism. It's a loose collection of slightly different theories. I've already started to mention some of them. And the emphasis is on symbols and the meanings we give to those symbols. So, you know, whether it's a gay rights flag or it's a Nazi salute, you know, those are both symbols and they have different meanings. So the symbolic interactionists are interested in two processes, the social construction uh, of something. So, for example, the Nazi salute um we have attached that meaning to that hand or arm gesture that putting your arm up in the air and uh, laying putting your hand flat that has no meaning okay really from a biological point of view or scientific point of view but we have applied uh meaning to that we've said that's that's a, a nazi salute that represents this um, in the 1930s and 40s in Germany that was seen as something that was very respectful now it's seen as something quite abhorrent 
Um, and also the labeling is one of the key processes they're interested in, like um, how groups are seen by others or individuals are seen by others, so labeled, and that process of self-fulfilling prophecy uh, becoming the label. Key thinkers are Mead, Bloomer, Becker, Cooley and Goffman. Um, and I will, if you're my class, have asked you to commit complete reading on those thinkers and making quite detailed notes that you'll be feeding into on the next few slides. Uh, so they're very interested in things like impression management. Um, and they're really interested in this kind of the what, what I'd probably call the private self and the public self, which is a lot to do with Goffman's idea ideas. Um, and social media is quite a useful tool here, and you might have been asked to do an activity like this before. Um, if you look at someone's social media profile, whether it's their Facebook, Instagram, or what have you, and you perhaps know that person personally, or even your own, would you argue that their social media self is their real self, or have they actually managed that impression to an extent? Is there a difference between their private self that you might know, or you, you might know yourself, and the one that they're trying to kind of share on social media? Um, and this will be the activity that I'll have asked you to do if you're one of my students. I'll have asked you to look at these images and sort them how you think they might link to each of these thinkers. Again, some of them can be used interchangeably, so don't panic too much if you've got them all wrong. Um, but I'm going to talk through these five thinkers next, and you can add additional notes to an A3 mind map using these images if you want. Or, you know, if it suits you to do notes, that's absolutely fine. So I just want to nip through the ideas of Mead initially. Um, he uh, was the guy who very much talked about symbols. Um, you've got a range of symbols there on to the right-hand side. Uh, and he said, we inhabit a world of meaning and we attach symbols to the world to help us make sense of it. Um, and what he, he meant by that is, that, you know, there's no way we could actually interact with each other unless we understood what different movements, facial expressions, voice tones, all these things meant. Otherwise, we'd constantly be offending one another. Um... And he talks about this interpretive phase is key. Um, when we when we see a gesture or we see something happen, we we think, what does that mean? Okay, what's the wider context of that? And it's it's a process that we are doing constantly and really rapidly, probably subconsciously to an extent. Uh, so if someone shakes their fist at us, we're going to think, hang on, is that in jest? Is it a la for a laugh? Are they angry with me? And we'll have to think, well, hang on, this is my friend doing it. So they're probably joking, um, a, you know, or it could be um, a revolutionary leader, leader, for example, such as Ayatollah Khamenei that you've got there in the top right hand corner, shaking his fist in, in victory, shaking his fist to unite his people. Or is it a symbol of resistance against, um, you know, the suppressive regime, uh, for example, the Shah's regime prior to 1979 in Iran? Uh, some of you might be aware of that example. Um, so it's important when we see fish shaking that we recognise what's the context. Okay. Um, <clears throat> in order to figure out what a symbol means uh, or, or why someone acts or looks the way they do at you, you sort of have to interpret how they view you. You have to guess what their view of you is. Um, and this is quite a complex process of seeing ourselves through the eyes of the other. Now, we learn this, according to me, through the family. Uh, so we copy our parents. You might play, you know, if you hang out with your mum and dad or your mum, mostly when you're very young, well, not all the time, you might mimic your mum. Um, and that would allow you to understand how your parents see you, how they expect you to behave as a child, uh, the rules they expect you to follow. And as a result of that process, you are able to understand how you should be behaving and you do behave in that way. Uh, later on, that becomes more complex uh, in the community, we see ourselves through the generalised other, the wider community. Uh, we understand what others expect of us in terms of our behaviour, and we, we kind of don't want to deviate from those um, expectations in case, and if we did, people would react negatively to that, and we'd probably think, oh, God, I've offended them, or I've, I've displeased them in some way, and we'd modify our behaviour. And this sort of helps society works as we kind of act how others expect us to in, in a variety of roles. So Mead sort of felt behaviour could sort of be predictable to an extent, even though he would definitely sit within the sort of symbol symbolic interactions framework. Uh, Bloomer, uh, very similar to Mead, but takes his ideas a bit further, um, particularly this notion of our idea not being, our behaviours not being predictable. Um, like Mead, he said humans are not cats, we do not react, or sorry, not animals, we do not react in a pre-programmed way to stimulus, we're not like puppets. 
Um, we do not passively respond to interactions like functionalists would argue. Um, so, for example, functionalists would say that we're very much the product of our families, our genders, our class, for example. Um, we negotiate with others and, and choose how we interact. Our behaviour is not fixed, according to Bloomer. Um, so he's very much into this idea of negotiation, and that's probably where the free will would come into play. Um, so we negotiate how to react based on previous encounters and our feelings. So, you know, if one of your mates did, I don't know, beat you in a computer game or something and then shook their fist at you in victory, uh, you might be, one, one day you might be like, oh, God, yeah, that's funny, and have a laugh. The next day you might be so sick of being beaten by them, you might actually get really knocked off, stand up and storm away. So you, you've taken exactly the same symbol and reacted in two completely different ways on, on two different days for a variety of reasons. So we're more complex than puppets, for example. Um, and yet, like we said, there's plenty of different symbols that we use. Uh, so, for example, how can you tell if someone's horrible or nice just by looking at them? Um, you know, you could use teachers, for example. Um, how can you look at a teacher before you've had any interaction with them and go, oh, God, they look horrible, they look scary, they look quite strict? Um, it could be their facial expressions. It could be the way they dress. Um, are you more likely to judge a teacher in, I don't know, a suit as someone who's more strict, whereas someone who might dress in a much more relaxed way? You're going to say, oh, they're probably going to be a bit more, bit more easygoing, perhaps. Um, but the thing is, uh, Bloomer argued that we're very good at negotiating our reactions and negotiating our behaviour. So if you then interact with that teacher in a classroom you might find that your initial impression was completely wrong so you might modify your behavior towards them uh, so if you go into the classroom with a strict teacher you might um, well you might choose a variety of ways to react depending on who you are but if you're a model student you might be sit very quietly you might very work very hard very studiously and not laugh but as you find out that this teacher was actually maybe a bit of a laugh they tell lots of jokes they can be very relaxed they can be very friendly and fun and approachable you might then start acting differently in that classroom uh, because of that and perhaps not kind of be so studious and maybe be a bit more, have a bit more fun. Um, yeah, and that's all negotiation. Okay, labelling theory and Becker, and I know that we've done this quite a lot throughout the past couple of years, um, but I just want to spend a bit of time talking about the deviant career in this particular slide. Um, so, as you know, a label is a process by which we attach a meaning or definition to someone or a group, positive or negatively. Uh, W.I. Thomas said that if we believe a situation is real, so if we believe our label, it will become real in its consequences. That's a self-fulfilling prophecy. So if we believe that we are, we are a high-achieving student, then we will work hard because we believe in ourselves and, you know, that becomes a reality in exam results, in theory. Um, so... The opposite of that obviously being is if a teacher believes a student is difficult, they may treat them differently, more harshly, they might belittle them, they might send them out of the classroom, they might discipline them more often. And as a result, that student perhaps isn't going to achieve as highly as they could do. Um, so Becker talked about careers um, in terms of labelling. And he talks about this kind of deviant career and he says it's a bit like a legitimate career. Um, it has different stages, progression and status. And the example from the textbook is, is very much about mental illness that I find quite useful. Um, so if I explain to you how a deviant career can come about through the label of mentally ill. Um, so for whatever reason, somebody might be stressed, they might be tired, they might be slightly depressed, for example, or, or they might actually have quite a serious uh, mental health issue but they will perhaps start acting a bit differently they might be a bit snappy they might be more withdrawn so relatives might start to treat that person um, differently might be more cautious around them uh, might perhaps um, tell them that they're acting weird they're acting strangely they're acting depressed um, the individual might then take on that label from their family member and they could start acting slightly differently or, or conforming to the label um, the problem is, uh, is when the patient or family perhaps reports the symptoms to a doctor um, and the person goes to see a doctor or a psychologist um, who then confirms the diagnosis, um, confirms and gives them the label of being mentally ill. Says, yes, you, you are chronically depressed. Yes, you are very stressed. Yes, you are schizophrenic. Yes, you are uh, bipolar. Um, 
the problem being, once you get a label like that from an official, whether it's a, a person in authority, whether, it, I don't know, it could be, in this case, it's a, a psychologist, but in education, it could be a teacher, uh, in the criminal justice system, it could be a police officer or a judge. When you get labels like this from officials, that becomes almost like an institutionalised label. It's really hard to get rid of. So, it, particularly if it's something serious like bipolar um, or schizophrenia, you could be institutionalised for a time. Uh, and I mean that in case of actually being put into a mental asylum of some of some sort or a care unit um, or hospital. Um, and then you may well be discharged. However, you can only really be discharged from one of these units if you accept your label. So you accept that you're mentally ill. You think, I want you tell them you want to get better. And you take the drugs, you do the therapy and then you can leave. So you have to accept your label in order to leave. Um, however, one of the issues are with our society is that being mentally ill then becomes their master status and people might treat them as such. Um, so every t people might know that they spent some time in a, in a care unit facility or, or a therapeutic context. They might know that they spent some time in a, in a high security hospital and they might be a bit cautious around this person. They might be less likely to let them play with their children, for example. They might not want to spend time with them because they're a bit nervous around them. So that label of being mentally ill now becomes their master status and the individuals will find it quite difficult to reintegrate into society whether it's through spending time with friends and family or even like getting a job for example and as a result they can suffer anime some of you will be familiar with that process you know feeling a sense of normlessness and that can lead to reinstitutionalization in many cases they might whether it's another mental health facility or the criminal justice system might pick them up because they might end up turning to crime, deviants, drugs, for example. Um, so that can lead to a reinstitutionalisation and the process carries on. So that's what Becca means by a deviant career. Um, and the best evidence to support this um, is the Rosenhan being sane in insane places experiment. And I'd like you to find that clip on YouTube, please. It's a seven minute clip it's been posted by someone called Mr. Bowden. And if you Google Rosenhan dash being insane in insane places, you should be able to find it. Or you can scan the QR code on this lecture. Um, just a quick, uh, so I want you to have a look at that um, uh, experiment and, and annotate how that demonstrates deviant career. Um, I won't talk to you about it in too much detail, um, but Rosenhan uh, had his uh, psychology students, I think they were, or psychiatry students, um, he had them uh, go to their doctors and report um, several symptoms of, I think it was schizophrenia, um, about hearing voices. And um, they were, you know, then uh, admitted into hospital, into a psychological unit, a secure unit. But once they were inside, so inside, um, they then started acting completely sane. Okay, completely sane. Um, however... Despite acting completely sane when they were inside, they were unable to get discharged for a number of days, a number of weeks in some cases, despite that the fact that they met regularly with psychiatrists, with carers, um, with health workers, they were not seen as sane uh, because the power of that initial diagnosis of being insane was so powerful, that master status, that they would not allow them to leave unless they admit it to being insane in the first place. But I'd like to watch that clip fully and annotate your ideas. Uh, just a quick AO3 evaluation point here. Uh, labelling theory is seen as fairly deterministic in compared to other interactionist theories. Um, because once you get your label, you're sort of stuck with it. There's not much room for free will to get out of your label. Um, the other labelling theorist that you need to be aware of is obviously Cooley you'll have come across a few times before, and his concept of the looking glass self, where we develop our self-concept through our, the interaction process. We understand who we are through interacting to other people. So, you know, you might interact with a group and the way they respond to you, if they will laugh, for example, you might think, oh, you know, I'm quite funny, that's my role, I'm the funny person, I'm a funny guy, funny girl. Um, and as a result, you might play up to that role more and more often until it becomes your a firm part of your identity. Um... It's very similar to Mead in that case because you take on the role of the other to understand how you are seen and then you act up to that role. 
you are you feel like you're labeled by the group and then you become that label so i don't know in the in the family you might be the the I don't know, the lazy, the lazy one. Um, so you think, oh, my parents think I'm lazy, so therefore I'm going to conform to that label when I'm home. Um, or you might be seen as the hardworking one, for example. Um, so we sort of self-mirror. We become what people see us as. And that image in the bottom right-hand corner might be quite familiar. Um, and how others react to it sort of becomes our self-concept. And we can, but in a clearly slightly different to me, because he argues that we can have multiple roles and we can sort of consciously switch between them quite easily. Um, and I always find that quite interesting, that diagram at the bottom, the one with the devil horns, is how my ex-girlfriend sees me. Um, and if any of you do have any ex-girlfriends or boyfriends, uh, when you ha see them, and if they do think really badly of you, you know, does your behaviour confirm that view? Like, do you act in such a way that they might think, oh, that person is awful, I'm completely right, or are you really, really lovely to them to try and get them to change their minds? I'm guessing more often than not, you're more likely to kind of just ignore them, be a bit mean to them, and maybe confirm that way they view the, the way they might view you. Uh, and finally, uh, is Goffman's dramatological model, one of my favourites. <clears throat> so in terms of the images, he talks about the idea that, you know, we all carry out performances, that we all carry, it's like we're on a red carpet, we're aware that we're being watched by other people, and we act in a way to create a particular image to them. Um, we, um, he talks about stages, the argument that we're all actors. Um, we use props to present ourselves to the audience. Uh, so, for example, if you want to be the ideal pupil, you, um, you know that wearing good uniform is um, a way of send sending out that message. You know that putting your hand up often, um, having the right equipment, um, being on time, those are all symbols or props that you can use to set out that image. Uh, I've got the mime artist there um, because he talks about impression management. Uh, we are conscious of ourselves, our language, our tone of voice, etc., to manage our performance. So we are the ones in control of that. Um, and he's very interested in this notion of front stage and backstage. Um, so he talks about everyone having a backstage uh, or the real self. And uh, we only really have that person or that role when we are by ourselves. Um, so, you know, you might argue in the common room, people might drop the ideal pupil act, but then even in the common room or the or your, your wherever you might go to relax with your friends, you're then putting on a different performance. Um, so when people are really are their real self, it's probably when they're by themselves. Um, and Goffman argues that, you know, there there is a bit of a gap between the roles we perform and who we really are. Um, he calls it role distancing. Um, so there's a lot of flexibility in how we perform those roles, like, you know, uh, mother, student, I don't know, uh, footballer, you know, there's different ways of performing each of those roles, we don't all do them the same, we sort of do make a conscious choice of how we want to be perceived by other people, by, you know, a variety of symbols, by using them. So I just want to nip through the weaknesses of action and agency theories um, that you'll have come across possibly in other theoretic uh, areas of study as well. So they generally seem to ignore patterns in human behaviour. For example, more men commit suicide than women. So there must be a structural cause of that, whether it's to do with gender, the media, and what have you. Um, as a theory, uh, social action, agency, and symbolic interactionist theories they're very difficult to develop social policy solutions to. So if you don't figure out a structural cause of a problem, and how can we prevent it? So labelling, for example, we, we, we pretty much know labelling definitely takes place at a, a, a variety of levels in society, but you can't stop people doing it. You can't tell the media to not label groups, you know. Um, so there's no social policy solution. Uh, so therefore it's not very useful. Um, they tend to neglect the role of wider power structures in society, particularly around inequality and how these impact individuals because they're so interested in the micro, they don't look at those big structural causes. Um, like poverty, for example, will always limit the extent to which people can perform for certain roles. Um, like you might want to perform the role of being a, a multi-millionaire um, I don't know, banker, but you're not going to be able to afford the suit, you're not going to be able to afford the car to kind of give that impression. So poverty will always sort of limit the access to certain symbols and the, our ability to perform different roles. Um, 
they generally argue that structures are socially constructed, but some of these structures do become very powerful over time. Um, so particularly the role of religion, um, you've got um, theocratic states like Iran, Saudi Arabia, uh, where there is a, 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 a men melding, if you like, of uh, the religion and the state. So they're actually quite powerful in those countries. And if you look through the past, you've got plenty of examples of religion, which is arguably a social construct because it's been made up by humans to help us make sense of you know, where we're going, where we've come from. Um, but it has become very powerful. It controls loads of aspects of everyday life, even lawmaking in this country. Um, and there's an argument, particularly with Goffman, perhaps, that they, he sort of overstates the ability of us to control our actions um, and the impressions that we might give, especially when perhaps drunk and when we consider things like crimes of passion, for example. We can't always be in control. Finally, for the sake of analysis and evaluation, um, I want to run through structuration theory, which is Anthony Giddens' theory, which is something of a middle way. Uh, so if you do an essay on the structure agency debate, this is a good one to mention in your final paragraph or perhaps your conclusion if you've got time. Um, so Giddens argued that both approaches were wrong to an extent. Uh, it's not structure or agency, it's both, as there are clear connections between structure and agency. Um, yep, we all have choices. We've got free will or agency, but there are some boundaries. So, for example, all of you can probably choose to go to university, but mm, you can't all choose and be able to go to Oxford. Um, so what's limiting your ability to choose to perhaps go to Oxford? Some of you might be able to go to Oxford, which is fantastic, but can you imagine what might limit um, or what structures might stop someone perhaps applying to Oxford? Um, it quite likely is stuff that happened maybe many, many years ago. Um, you know, your GCSE results, for whatever reason, weren't the right results to kind of put you on a pathway to get into Oxford. You know, and was that failure perhaps because of gender issues or was it because of, you know, poverty? Um, was it because of, uh, you know, the inequalities that exist through the setting and streaming system? Was it because of where your parents lived? Um, so ultimately, there are structures in place that have probably limited many of our ability to choose to go to Oxford. Um, you know, and I've given the examples of poverty being one of the main ones there. Um, so structures will limit our choice of uni, and yet we can still choose which university to go to. Um, pretty much whatever the results you get, there will be a university course out there for you. Um, then again... We actually help to make the structures around us by repeating certain behaviour over and over again. This is, this is similar to the argument of C. Wright Mills, if you remember in the sociological imagination. So um, repeated human behaviour kind of becomes a norm and therefore a bit of a structure. Um, so, so it's worth arguing that structures both cause human behaviour but structures are also the outcome of repeated human behaviour. So the idea that poor people don't go to Oxford is perpetuated by the continuous human behaviour of working class students being less likely to apply and then less likely to be accepted when they do. So because of human behaviour uh, of working class people not applying to Oxford, we're not going to kind of change that structure of inequality um, in, when it comes to the class of students going to Oxford. Um, an example I'd like you to think about is selfie taking. Uh, when I was young, selfie, selfies didn't exist, um, largely because the technology didn't exist, to be honest with you. Um, but it has become something of a norm or a structure. And um, it probably came about in the last 10 years, selfie taking didn't really exist before that. Um, so how have agents, how have individuals, particularly the youth, if you like, how have they created this social structure? Um, and selfie taking, I think, has become something of a structure in the sense it's now become such a norm. It's completely normal now to go, let's take a selfie. Whereas 10 years ago, when we first started seeing this selfie taking, it, it seemed like quite vain to stand there and take lots of pictures of yourself and your friends. But now it's perfectly normal. My mother even does it, and she's in her 70s. Um, Giddens uses the example of uh, the monetary system to illustrate this uh, structuration theory, the blend of structure and agency. So... He says that, you know, he didn't invent the monetary system and the monetary system, if you like, is a structure, 
but he has to use it if he needs to get food. So we have to all engage with these structures in our society, even if we don't feel that we've actively created them. Um, but by repeatedly using the monetary system, we perpetuate its use. If we all stopped using it, then the monetary system would collapse and we'd have to change it to something else. So our repeated behaviour keeps that structure going. Okay, And we invented currency. Um, it used to be hundreds and maybe thousands of years ago, uh, we would exchange things for goods, but now we actually use currency of sorts or a variety of means. Uh, so we've created the money to, in order, the currency system in order for us to exchange goods. Um, however, it's not a one-way street now. Think about how our behaviour, particularly in maybe the past few years as agents, how, what have we done to sort of change our monetary system um, you know, and I've given you an example there of using like, you know, a smart pay using your phones. Um, so what's actually changing about money and how we use it? Um, it you know, are we actually seeing less money um, because of the, the rise of technology? Because we, for us, it's more convenient to not carry money around. And you think about your, your own behavior, like how often do you, do you go out of the house without a purse or a wallet now because you don't particularly need it? Now, that would be completely un, unheard of in, like, your parents' youth and you've got definitely your grandparents' youth. Um, so maybe have a conversation with them about how different even money has become because of changes in our behaviour. So finally, just to kind of conclude this lecture, and I appreciate it's a long one, structure and agency are interrelated. Human beings are knowledgeable and we follow a complex set of conventions and rituals. This is structure. And the example I've used here is Christmas. So when it comes to Christmas, we generally will follow lots of conventions and rituals. So we follow rules and laws, um, but we use our own knowledge of what's happened before or our free will and choices uh, in order to make sure that we have certain freedoms within, this, within these parameters. So no matter what, it stays the same every Christmas. Um, so whether it's, you know, everyone getting together around the same table, each Christmas is always different to the one before. OK, um, so there is free will. Otherwise, every Christmas would be exactly the same. It'd be really boring. So structure does depend on regular human behavior, but structures wouldn't really exist without our actions being repeated to create it. Again, Christmas is a good example because Christmas is something of a structure with the rituals and conventions around it. However, we are the ones that repeat the traditions of Christmas and keep it going. Um, if we stop doing that, then Christmas as a celebration, as a tradition, would probably vanish in the form that we recognise it as now. And it has changed over time. How many of you actually go to church compared to perhaps 100 years ago? That's a significant difference. So it does suggest that agents can create, change the structures around them. So I'm just going to leave you with an example 20 mark theory question that you could get on the AQA paper. Examine the usefulness of the structure versus agency debate and explaining how our contemporary society operates. The key word there being the contemporary. Um, so that's current society. So you need recent examples to kind of answer this question. And what I've done in the next slide is nip through an example essay plan that I perhaps might use um, based on the lectures that I've given on the structure and agency debate so far. This is the third of um, three, obviously. Um, so an in introduction, I might define structure, structural theory versus agency theories. First point, I might talk about C. Wright Mills' ideas. I'll use some of the examples we looked at in lecture one on um, you know, domestic violence. And then the second one, looking at India's toilets example. Uh, second point, um, I might make a point of uh, evaluating um, perhaps the structuralist point of view, being critical of this determinism. Uh, ignoring the role of individuals, create, individuals creating social change, perhaps using ideas of Weber and Calvinism, if you know that point of view, where uh, Calvinists were uh, credited with creating the economic change of introducing modern capitalism uh, into European society. I might evaluate this. Um, Point three, structural research is useful in examining how society operates. So census data and crime statistics in creating policy. Uh, and then I might evaluate that by saying that official crime statistics actually ignore labelling in the police. They need more appropriate method to uncover the causes of offending and, and solutions. So therefore, structural approaches are not useful. And then I might finish off by looking at Giddens' middle way, how it's a combination of structure and agency with a conclusion. Um, you know, you could use those points. Um, you might want to make a point, a really strong point, perhaps of looking at, I don't know, moral panics uh, to illustrate the agency point of view. 
um, whether it's uh, you know the moral panic about immigrants contributing to you know racism and prejudice in the streets um, and the links between that and maybe the European Union referendum result, for example. You know, you can pick your own contemporary example to maybe illustrate the agency debate as well. Because I'm aware that not all of you will have studied the Calvinism um, topic in the beliefs unit. You might have looked at media, so you could use moral panics in the media instead of the Calvinism example for point two. Um, this slide, I've just given you um, an example of a quite detailed um, introduction, which you perhaps wouldn't have time to do in a 20 mark essay. But if you can read it, it might be a good way of getting you guys started. Okay. Uh, thanks for listening. Bye.